Discussing Europe in a changing world is definitely not an easy task. As the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said in her opening address, it's all about reshaping Europe for decades ahead. We're going to be doing and discussing that over the next two days, today and tomorrow, at the State of the Union conference, focusing particularly on eight topics. Among them, we're going to be talking public health, we're going to be discussing climate change, a strategic autonomy, global economy, and of course, we're going to be talking geopolitics. And the next session is the first one on this particular topic on geopolitics, the session moderated by Brigitte Lafon, director of the Robert Schuman Center and the Global Governance Program at the European University Institute. Good morning. My name is Bridget Laffin. I'm director of the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at the European University Institute. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all this morning and especially our distinguished guests to this plenary session on Europe at a time of great power competition. The State of the Union 2021 is devoted to Europe in a changing world. And it's precisely those changes that we want to grapple with in our discussion this morning. Graham Allison, that great student of international politics and applied history, argued in a recent book that the cardinal challenge of our time in international politics is the US-China relationship. Why? Because when a rising power develops the capacity to challenge a ruling power, the world enters turbulent waters. History teaches us that at times of great structural change, there is likely to be systemic competition between powers. Competition for privileged access to goods, markets, technologies, spheres of influence, security. And if overlaid with ideological competition, that competition can well be much sharper. The, this occurs, the deep structural shifts that we observe occur at a time of much greater uh, engagement in terms of globalization of goods, services, mobilities of peoples, and as we have understood in the last year, also of pandemics. And it also occurs at a time when there is accelerated technological change, the global digital transformation, and the added climate crisis. The US was the predominant global power in the latter half of the 20th century. Europe is an economic power in search of some geopolitical ballast. And China, under President Xi Jinping, has become a formidable geostrategic actor. We have 60 minutes to discuss these big topics. And the format of our session is that I will put some general questions and then more specific questions to our guests. But we really want engagement with you, the audience. So please send us your questions and I will filter them uh, to the panel. It's my great pleasure to formally welcome our three uh, speakers this morning. Let me briefly introduce them. Dr. Norbert Rotgen, Chair of the Bundestag Committee on Foreign Affairs since 2014, and a member uh, of the CDU. Professor uh, C. Kwan Tu, from the WTO, Professor and Dean at the WTO Institute, the China Institute, at the uh, University of International Business and Economics, and Dr. Leslie Vinjamuri, leader and director of the US and Americas program and director of the Academy for uh, Leadership in International Affairs at Chatham House, London's leading international relations institute. You're all very, very welcome. So let me begin with a very broad and general question. And that is, is great power competition the appropriate characterization or framing of the contemporary international system? Or to put it another way, is competition between the US and China the driver of international politics today? Perhaps we'll begin, uh, Dr. Rotkin, with your, uh, with your input. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for the introduction, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor for me to participate in this distinguished discussion. Thank you very much. And I'm picking up your question. Is it the, is it the 
precise and right characterization of what we are facing, the great power competition, the re-emergence in a way, uh, which we saw before World War II in the, in, in, in the 19th century, which was characterizing them. So I, I would say it's a little bit we should be a bit more precise. Yes, of course, it is a competition between powers, and at the it's it's an unraveling of international order, the post-war order. This big uh, uh, historical period uh, is finished and over. A, a new international architecture has yet to emerge. So we are in an historically in an in-between period, and we see. Uh, in this period for, in, for, in, of struggling for a new order, we see the competition of powers in order to uh, uh, grab uh, 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 as much uh, part of power, of international power, as, uh, as big players can. However, I, would, I think it's extremely important to add uh, in a, another element, because it's not just uh, the struggle and competition between powers, about their portion uh, of international power. What is really at the heart of it and makes it so complicated and so comprehensively is that it has become a competition of political systems. It's not just that China rising, having become a major competitor, uh, advanced, having advanced uh, significantly economically, technologically, even militarily, and under Xi Jinping, uh, having uh, uh, forged the will to shape international order, to be a, a, not only being focused on the internal development, but going beyond the borders and uh, assert political will. What is at the, at, the con at the heart of the conflict and the problem is that China does not only challenge the post-war, in a way, American Western liberal order, but it has an idea how to replace it. And China wants to replace the idea that international relations are, um, are dominated and ruled by law, by regulation, by agreement and treaty. It wants to replace this idea of rule of law by the idea that Chinese interests be respected. And if you don't respect vital Chinese interests, then you are violating uh, China, then you are disrespecting China, you are uh, uh, antagonizing China, and then you are creating the conflict if you disrespect Chinese interest. And the, one of the consequences only to mention is then that the idea of um, human rights, for example, uh, is abolished by China as an idea of universality. It's not any longer the universal interpretation and validity of human rights, but human rights render an internal affair. And if you dare to accuse a country because of, uh, of the violation of human rights, then you are interfering into the internal affairs. So, um, so we have this power conflict and the conflict about values, ideas, political systems. And the result is that we are going to see as the new paradigm of international relations, a comprehensive competition. Of course, the, most, the, 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 uh, the United States have fully accepted uh, this uh, challenge. Uh, but it is uh, going to affect the entire world. And it is about what is their idea for a new international order? Is it rule? Is it law? Uh, is it agreement? Uh, or is it interest of the strong? Uh, thank you very much. And what, I take two things from what you've said. Firstly, that this is, in a sense, a return to uh, times of great flux in history in the past when we had these sorts of shifts, but also you placed a lot of emphasis on the competition uh, of political systems and about the kind of global order that will emerge. Uh, let's have a Chinese perspective now, Professor uh, Si Quan Tu. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Um, the answer for me uh, would be yes, uh, to a large extent. 
Uh, while in the last uh, four decades, China had focused on economics, uh, economic development and not seen as a peer competitor or challenge by the United States. Now the US has confirmed that China is a great challenge to its uh, hegemony, although China itself uh, never claims to do that. Uh, because of, actually, because of US great efforts to integrate China into uh, the international economic system, the two countries are closely intertwined with each other as well as with other parts of the world. In that the, 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 the power competition between the US and China has to, has to get all others involved. Uh, but having said that, uh, I don't think that uh, either the US or China has the power to dominate other middle or even small countries in the current era. Uh, in this sense, I don't think that uh, there will be a new so-called new Cold War. Uh, China has never said that uh, it will try to build an anti-US alliance. Uh, even the US has repeatedly claimed that uh, it won't force others choose a side between the US and China. So uh, while politics is a reality uh, we have to face, uh, our mind should not be controlled totally by it. Every country should still do its own business with its partners on the basis of mutual benefits. I, I think one big lesson uh, in the last few years for us, for the whole world, is that uh, too much attention has been paid to politics rather than to economics or business. Uh, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you. And I think one important distinction between what we see today and the bipolar world of the post-war era is, of course, that the Russian, the US, Russia were not interconnected economically, whereas today we live in a highly globalized world where a lot of damage, if there is decoupling, uh, can be done to all countries in the world, but including those engaging in decoupling. So uh, from, for an American perspective, Leslie. Uh, thank you. And first of all, thank you for having me. It's, it's a real honor to, to be speaking at this conference and in particular on this panel with such distinguished um, participants. Um, I, I think the geopolitical competition frame is sort of a useful hook it tells us something very big and very general and, and very, in some ways, very obvious about the world that we live in. But I think it's woefully inadequate, um, I think, for sort of moving forward into the, the big and important debates. And I think that, um, I think that my, my colleagues on this panel have done a very good job of taking us beyond this, what is really a very simplistic framing. Um, to, and I guess I would add a couple of things to it. First, um, it, this is clearly, a period of time where power has diffused um, away from what the so-called West towards Asia and, and China in particular, um, but also where you know economic power has you know sits largely in non-state entities, um, where public power is diffused to many other states as well, uh, and where the the world is in intensely complex and interdependent in a way that previous eras of intense geopolitical competition uh, were, were frankly very, very different. Um, and I think the, the key thing there is that, you know, of course we talk about competition, but we all know that the imperative for the, the states that are at the heart of that competition to pull together uh, on the um, provision of the big public goods is, is I think the number one challenge of our time, whether it's from managing a pandemic to preventing the next one, global public health challenges, uh, climate, um, uh, technology competition. And I would say that, you know, we tend to frame this as these are the cooperative dimensions and then we have the competitive areas. I think, frankly, that competition is a driver even of all of these uh, public goods. And, and I would take climate as an example. Um, the, the focus on climate policy in the US is one that is being um, certainly uh, proposed through a set of measures that are designed to make the US economy much more uh, competitive, not only in, in a way that delivers to a broader range of American people, but one that allows it to compete with China and with many other uh, countries when it comes to the key technologies uh, of climate and the key sectors in which 
um, the economy is going to be driven in, in that direction. So I think, you know, the competition versus cooperative frame isn't quite right. It's too stark. But I think that the focus on provision of public goods is arguably even more at the forefront of the international system in this current period uh, than, than geopolitical competition. The second thing I would say is that on order, I think Norbert's comments were, were exactly right that China doesn't feel satisfied, nor do frankly many other powers, I would say India is one, with the existing rules-based order. We saw this in Anchorage where the Americans were saying the rules-based order and the Chinese were saying the UN system. And I guess my point here is that what's interesting in this period is that China isn't seeking to disengage. It wants to participate at the UN. It wants to participate at the WHO. Um, you know, there's a question about what participation will look like at the WTO and whether the US will uh, be, a, be a strong participant. I think we're more optimistic now. But it's a struggle over what the rules will be and what the key forums will be, rather than whether there will be an international order in which uh, the key players are participating. And I think that makes puts us in a wholly different context. And then my final point would be the big challenge, certainly um, for the US, and, and I would argue for Europe, is, is the domestic challenge. And it's rebuilding and redistributing the gains of our democracies and our and our economies in a way that makes people think that it's worth uh, staying in the game of this very competitive international system. Because at the, at the moment, a lot of Americans certainly um, feel disenfranchised and, and don't understand why this competition is one that they should um, that they should invest in. So I think that that's how I see some of the big challenges of this period. So I think we'll come back to the to the global order and how those public goods can be uh, can be built uh, cooperatively across the world. But perhaps if I could ask about the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic, it has clearly fueled tensions, accentuated tensions in terms of trade and finance and currency and security. And one potential future for the world is a more regionalized, more divided, more decoupled world. Or, and this is my question to you, does the arrival of President Biden in the White House, does it offer us in the world a multilateral moment where there can be the search for those global public goods? And if it is a multilateral moment, then where would one look to, to build back the multilateral system because there is flux, there is tension, uh, and there is contestation about it. So perhaps this time, if I begin with Professor Tu. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, the, the, the Chinese people uh, tend to observe the world uh, through the uh, cyclical theory of the history. Uh, so from uh, 1991 to 2008, uh, the world has seen had seen a, a climax of uh, globalization. And then, since the global financial crisis, uh, globalization has lost its momentum due to a variety of reasons. Uh, the ban the pandemic is just another accelerator of this change, uh, especially reminding us uh, us that uh, too much dependence on foreign supply of uh, uh, critical products is risky uh, in the cases of uh, some unforeseeable uh, disasters, just like the pandemic. Uh, so um, I think uh, it is uh, kind of reasonable uh, to some extent to shortening uh, supply chains in some industries for, of course, not all countries, for some countries, including China. So China uh, last year, uh, we proposed the so-called uh, dual circulation strategy. Uh, uh, actually, one intention of this uh, strategy is to, as I said, to reduce uh, too much dependence or too high dependence uh, on, on foreign supply of some, for some products, not totally, of, of course. Um, however, uh, multilateralism is still necessary, I think even more necessary, uh, in a deglobalized uh, world, because there will be more conflicts and fr frictions at the better times. Um, so uh, I think we need to keep the multilateral platforms open and functioning and to deal with all the negative impacts 
uh, effects of such uh, uh, great transformation uh, under the rules-based international system. Uh, this is why uh, China has been so critical of uh, US uh, blockage of uh, WTO appellate body members appointments, uh, because uh, we believe that this kind of judicial uh, system is necessary to keep world trade open and uh, and uh, and function. Um, so of course now uh, the, the new Biden administration seems to be more positive about uh, uh, multilateralism, including the WTO. Uh, so we uh, uh, hope that uh, uh, we can develop some uh, new rules uh, or to uh, make some reforms. Uh, to the current, uh, to the existing international system. Uh, actually, uh, especially in the case of WTO, uh, there are a lot of uh, proposals about WTO reforms. Uh, but uh, my uh, thought is that uh, we can uh, make some consensus on some small, smaller issues rather than some uh, fundamental values or, or principles. Uh, then we can uh, build up our uh, mutual trust and uh, uh, move further forward. Thank you. So the WTO is one potential area for reform and change and uh, rebuilding rebuilding trust. Uh, Leslie. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that the it is a, it is a multilateral moment um, for one specific reason, which is that the US uh, is now playing ball. And that was clearly not the case in any reliable or um, desirable way uh, for the rest of the world over the past four years. So the, the, I, I think you cannot understate um, the significance, and, and I imagine we all feel this, of the change in administration of, of the election um, in the US. Uh, and so I think that, that that deep investment by the Biden administration uh, in the big multilaterals, but also in partnerships uh, with Europe in the quad, both of the quads, one many Europeans are hoping, um, is, is very, very significant, as well as, I mean, the announcement overnight is quite uh, extraordinary that the US is going to, you know, take it a step further, even on the question of supporting a, a waiver of the IP rights for the vaccines, this is this is quite dramatic change, and I don't think we can even begin to understate it. Um, I don't think that we will see a complete decoupling, and I think um, most people are skeptical of that because the interest in engagement, the economic gain that that the U.S. Uh, desires and feels um, among in the private sector is so robust and so strong. But I think that there is a real risk of multilateralism being something that is that operates at the level of almost gratuity and lip service in the large multilaterals and productive movement in those that are more Western oriented. And I think that is one of the concerns that there's multilateralism and there's multilateralism. Um, and so I think it is a risky moment and it does a lot of it come down to trust. So, and, and the pandemic has clearly been devastating um, for the issue of uh, certainly in the US domestic public attitudes um, towards trust in China have diminished dramatically. Um, and it's not clear that how that changes and how that goes the distance that it needs to to support um, more multilateral productive um, forward looking movement. Um, and I think the question of values is will really get in the way potentially of, of cooperation on questions of technology uh, through the major multilaterals, um, as well as pandemics and global health. And, and the WHO, I think, is, is a real concern that we all have cooperation there. I think la last, last night's announcement is a very strong signal from Washington that the America first era is, is at least the, the Trump legacy is being overcome. In it was a very major, very major announcement. Uh, Dr. Rothkin. Yes, I'm, I'm quite close to the assessment of, of Leslie. Uh, uh, so is, is Biden, does Biden, uh, the arrival of Biden mean a multilateral moment? I would say there are two sides. There is a yes and a no. Uh, there's a clear yes in the way you mentioned it, with the example of wavering intellectual property rights, which is which has fundamental significance, of course. Uh, and so uh, this administration is coming back 
uh, to the lines and currents of the, I would say, to the best currents of traditional post-war American foreign policy, which is open, which is internationalist, uh, which is values-based, and is seeking to engage with the world and particularly with uh, allies. They are seeking alliances, they want to cooperate. So this is clearly and fully a multilateral approach. On the other side, you can also see the decision on uh, intellectual property rights uh, regarding the vaccination. That it means also that America has decided also to compete on an international vaccination policy with China, because everything has become political, everything has become a part of the systemic competition, and they do not want to leave uh, soft power politics on vaccination to China uh, to be sympathetic to the world uh, and empath em 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 show empathy to the world and uh, provide the world with this public good but the United States is embracing also this area of competition with China. And yes, they are clearly determined uh, to compete with China uh, full scale, but they do not want it by withdrawing from the world and retreating behind the shores uh, of, of the country, but by uh, forging uh, alliances, the uh, alliance of the democracies, they want to um, strengthen their um, uh, uh, corporations, alliances, NATO, uh, the cooperation with, with Europe. So this all aims at getting into a better, stronger position in order uh, to be successful uh, and at the winning edge of the competition with China. So clearly two sides of multilateralism. Thank you. Uh, and now I'll move on to asking all three of you more specific questions about the region that you, uh, the region or area that you come from. And so because the focus of uh, our session is Europe at a time of great power competition, uh, I'm going to begin again uh, with Dr. Rotkin. So if I could ask you, what is the optimal EU strategy for dealing with this shift in global politics, the structural change? Will Europe be forced to take sides in this competition? How can Europe navigate its way through what is a, as we've discussed, a complicated, contested international system? Uh, summarizing what we have talked about in, in the recent half hour or so, one would be forced to say there is one conclusion for Europe. Certainly, the international global situation means this is the hour of Europe. It's not the hour of Germany. It's not the hour of France, of Italy, of the European nation state. But of course, we have to be strong to be a part of it in order to create the potential to shape uh, in the face of our values and interests and be a, part, a strong part in shaping international order. For this, we have to be strong and uh, the precondition of, of European strength is unity. And unity would start, and you have asked me for the optimal strategy, the, the unity would have to start with a will, with a will to transform the European Union from the extremely successful internal project, the internal free market, the internal regulation we have, to an external project, we have to exert our will and policy beyond our borders. In the, uh, in the, uh, by uh, uh, executing a European foreign policy, being a part of it. However, in the European hour, we are um, struggling um, more than ever before. We are weaker and more uh, disunited uh, than ever. We have east-west clashes and north-east and uh, north-south divides. The one more about the values, the other more about the economy. So we have to be realistic. I'm not going to see uh, in the foreseeable future a foreign policy of the 27 member states uh, making Europe 
one actor in uh, international policy as we have achieved to be uh, in trade policy. This is the big, big example, one European competence, one voice, and we have become a, 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 a world superpower in trade. Uh, it's, it's not, we are not as far, uh, but we are more disunited uh, internally than ever before since the Roman treaties. So what is the, the pragmatic conclusion out of this? What I think is necessary and doable is to forward, to start, not to theoretically uh, design wishful thinking, but to just start with an alliance of four, five, six, open to all the member states, foreign policy of those who are willing and able, but primarily willing uh, to compromise on foreign policy of several items, how to engage, where to engage, what are the risks, what are the resources, and to exert one foreign policy in different areas. So I think this is what should be the start of the evolving of a, of a and one European foreign policy. This is an existential question for us. It's a question of being getting relevant or getting irrelevant. We have to live up to become a, an actor and a power, otherwise uh, we will lose our potential to influence politically international order. And if I could ask you on some of the debate about this is about strategic autonomy, European sovereignty and strategic autonomy means different things in different areas, but it all underpinning it all is about capacity to, to do and to act and how where do you think this discussion is at at the moment, is it simply. A, a, a discursive um, a field, or is there is there something behind it? Yes, there's. You are right. There is something behind it. Truly, uh, European sovereignty, autonomy, autonomy and sovereignty in a globalized, interdependent world where even China and the United States are not able to decouple, but we are in a in a in a disunited and relatively weak uh, uh, um, condition, and we are claiming to be sovereign. So the thought behind this uh, illusion is, are we going to do it together with the United States, or are we claiming to be a third power between the United States and China? This is, in my assessment, what is truly behind the rhetoric of European sovereignty, which I can't uh, identify as a reality. We just so have seen the effect of, of American extra, uh, uh, extra territorial uh, sanctions. The dollar is the leading currency and uh, we have to surrender to it. We are not able to guarantee our own security. We are intertwined uh, in international uh, relations, uh, uh, in international e economic relations. So I think there is no sovereignty. Even the United States uh, aren't able to be sovereign in a globalized world. So the, this is a code word for, are we going to do it closely with the United States without embracing a Cold War? Uh, or are we trying to, to, to build uh, um, and, and uh, uh, understand ourselves as a third power. I strongly advocate for getting stronger as a part of the transatlantic alliance. Otherwise, I think we will not succeed. Thank you. So let's now move on to China. And uh, Professor Tu, what, what is the official Chinese view of these relationships, Washington, the EU? Uh, does uh, Beijing see the US as a declining power, perhaps a hostile power? And then where does the EU come in, in the uh, Beijing calculus? Okay, uh, these are big questions. Uh, I'm afraid I, I cannot speak for the, the Chinese government. I'm <laughs> even not a member of the Communist Party. Uh, but I have noticed and uh, also taken part in some discussions about uh, these questions. 
uh, actually the Chinese government has had a, an official uh, assessment of the shifts, uh, which is phrased as uh, the world is uh, undergoing uh, changes unseen in a century. Uh, so that's a long phrase. Uh, we think that the key variable uh, is the attitude of the US toward the rising China. Uh, China is not, not trying to challenge the US hegemony, but uh, we, we will have to become the largest economy in the world as long as we keep developing, uh, simply because we have the largest population. Uh, so we believe that uh, this is a legitimate and natural process. Uh, but the U United States seems increasingly anxious and unhappy with that. Uh, although the Biden administration claimed that uh, it is not going to contain China, uh, and only trying to uh, correct uh, China's uh, bad policies and practices. Uh, but the more and more Chinese people believe that uh, no matter what China will do, the US will not be satisfied. Uh, so the, so the, then the US actions are not against our system, uh, but our country and the people as a whole. So in this sense, at least I think more Chinese people uh, think that uh, the US is hostile, somewhat uh, hostile to China. Uh, with regard to the EU, uh, I personally have always advocated a higher priority on the relationship. Uh, in particular, I always suggested that China should uh, reach the investment agreement uh, with the EU first, instead of the US. But uh, Actually, we spent uh, uh, a number of years uh, on uh, the, the, the US in vain. <laughs> um, and also, I was very excited when uh, the CHI was uh, concluded uh, in the end of last year. Uh, but uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the sanctions related to Xinjiang uh, destroyed uh, the process, at least uh, po postponed uh, the, the process. Uh, it is really a pity. Um, uh, I personally understand and uh, respect uh, the US care about the general human rights. Uh, but uh, uh, the accusation of uh, genocide or oppression on ethnic minorities really contrary to the common sense and uh, the feelings of uh, ordinary Chinese people. I'm not an expert on Xinjiang. I, I, I haven't even been to Xinjiang. <laughs> China is too big, uh, but uh, we Han, Han Chinese, Han nationality uh, Chinese people uh, accounting for over 90% of the total population. Actually, we often complain that uh, the government has given too many preferential treatments to minorities. So it's uh, really difficult for us to understand uh, this kind of uh, uh, rhetoric. Um, so, yeah, anyway, thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, Leslie, to the US and the Biden administration and how it's setting out its stall on, uh, on the relationship with China, but also if perhaps you might say something about transatlantic relations as well. Um, I guess I, I do want to say one brief thing in response to Professor Tu also, which is that one thing that always strikes me when China, um, as do so many countries, feel aggrieved when the rest of the world speaks about their domestic um, human rights uh, issues, is that I always I always want to say to my to my Chinese colleagues, welcome to the world of being a major power. <laughs> where the name of the game in the global system that we have, where we have standards for human rights and individual rights and exchange and trust and transparency, is that you are scrutinized. And I can tell you as a, as a US um, academic and think tanker living outside my country, we are scrutinized every hour of every day of every week. And I, and I quite frankly welcome it. And I think it is part of um, playing a significant role um, in the international system. And I think that that will be a transition 
that many Chinese citizens um, have to have to go through because it is it is not always pleasant. I can tell you that because we, as as you said, you can't speak for the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I can't. I, I'm not part of the Biden administration, but trust me, one, once you leave the country, you are expected to um, represent it or explain it in some way, shape, or form. And I think I think there's some value and utility to that. Uh, the Biden administration is very clear that it does not see competition with China about being a cold war. It does not see this about containment, but it does see this as being about extreme um, competition uh, around a series of questions that are very high stakes for the future, not only of the US economy, of the transatlantic economies, um, but also for the international rules-based order. And those some of those are about values and human rights. And a lot of those are just simply about fair standards for market access, um, technology exchange. And there's a deep interest in, in keeping those standards exactly so that there, that there will be um, high levels of, of exchange and interdependence and so that there won't be decoupling. I think the key, the key dilemma for the US or the key challenge and the Biden administration has made this very clear to all of us and I think they're right uh, which is that if America wants to lead in partnership with, especially with its transatlantic partners, it has to demonstrate that democracy and its um, you know, capitalist economy, if you want to call it that, can actually deliver in a way that is not only good for its people and its citizens in particular, but that's also attractive and appealing beyond its borders. And that just hasn't been the case um, for the last four years. America, you know, we see it in the Pew Global Attitudes polls, how people view the leadership has sort of spilled over into how they view democracy in America and the country. So I think we are going to see a period where the US recognizes that investing in itself is also investing in global leadership. It needs to do this um, with European partners. And then I think, you know, there's some really deep issues that go beyond even, you know, the big ones of inequality, um, disinformation, the news environment, but there's a fundamental question in the US about the future of the Republican Party. And I think that when Europeans look at America and they try to say, is this, is this a country, to go back to, uh, to, to my colleagues' um, comment about, is it gonna be Europe on its own or Europe with America? I think part of what's going on is that Europe is wondering what happens in four years if the Democrats are not reelected and they look at the debates and the, and the sort of devastation of the Republican Party, the infighting, uh, and, and, there's, and there's certainly room to be concerned. So again, I think that you know, the future of US leadership is a domestic as well as a global question, but it's one that, that at the moment looks like it's very much invested in working with the Atlantic partners. Thank you. Now I want to put some questions from the uh, from the audience to you, and most of them are about Europe. So one from Anke Kenneth, and it is regionalism versus multilateralism. And the question is, if the EU fails to tackle issues like climate change, human rights via multilateralism, can it solve it by going the regional route using uh, free trade agreements? In other words, using economic power. Then a question about uh, it's significant that although the that the CAI is now being frozen and the EU is pivoting to India, will uh, will India now replace China? And then finally, a, a, a specific question uh, to Dr. Rotjen, and that is uh, the alliances of the willing. Uh, will that require eventual activation of qualified majority voting? And would you oppose in, in foreign policy? And would you oppose this? So those are the three questions. And then if I may add, if they don't apply, if those questions are ones you don't want to answer, uh, can I ask, because we're in our last uh, three minutes each per speaker, uh, can I ask if you could identify two areas where we could, where the world should look for cooperation rather than competition? So perhaps uh, as most of the questions were on Europe, Dr. Rochin, if I begin with you. Yeah, thank you. So perhaps very specifically the question of the, the alliance of the willing. I would consider this alliance to work on an intergovernmental basis. Uh, so I, I, I couldn't consider this to be a, a tool of a, 
a, a EU internal uh, um, uh, 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 group building, but it would be done on an inter intergovernmental basis. Besides, it would then open also to include Britain as a part of a uh, of an uh, European alliance working together on a, in foreign and security policy. So it's not a matter of a majority voting, uh, which I'm not realistically going to see. Uh, I, I think we are not going to see majority voting because we do not have the consensus for, uh, for the acceptance of a majority by the minority. And I think truly, uh, in truth, this is, uh, uh, this is valid both for smaller countries uh, which have a veto power as their remaining power, as for big countries like France, uh, for example. Um, so this is the question of the alliance, and there was the uh, so the cooperation question. Uh, where, where can we see cooperation? So what we should aim at desperately is to establish, to, we will see competition, and competition is inevitable and I would like, like I, I welcome competition. What we should aim at is to agree on some elements of a framework uh, of, of regulation rules, uh, what is excluded uh, from the, which tools are excluded from the competition. So in a way, a, a minimum of civilization in the big power competition, I think we should aim at. The matter of climate change will be also a matter of competition. I think China thinks that it can't afford in the uh, coming decade uh, to start a really ambitious program on uh, uh, CO2 reductions. China uh, considers itself to be absolutely dependent on quantitative economic growth. And for that, it, 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 it has come to the conclusion it's not, uh, has not reached an economic technological level to reduce significantly CO2 reduction. So we are going to see the increase of CO2 emissions by the, uh, by the biggest, single biggest CO2 emitter of the world with a share of 28% currently. So what do we have to do? We have to do to seek cooperation with China. Without China, climate change is not going to be resolved. But we have to go uh, uh, in advance, have perhaps to forge a transatlantic climate union and give evidence to our ambition that wealth, economic success is compatible with climate uh, policy. Climate protection is even the pre precondition of sustainable industry. And we have to deliver to the world and to China that this combination symbiosis is possible, and then China can uh, Im embark on this uh, Western path. Uh, uh, Professor Tu. Uh, I would say a few words on the relationship between regionalism and multilateralism. Uh, I think uh, regional FTAs are not a good thing for the WTO, but uh, for the world, I think they are fine. Uh, uh, regionalism can uh, be complementary to uh, multilateralism. Uh, and the countries have the freedom to uh, negotiate a, a higher level, uh, a high quality uh, regional agreements uh, on some areas. Uh, just like uh, what happened in the in RCEP or uh, CPTPP. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the WTO has no uh, power to uh, refuse such kind of uh, actions. So, uh, of course, and for, for Europe and for, for other countries, including US and EU, they all have this freedom to do that. I think, uh, as I said, uh, these kind of actions, uh, uh, accumulate uh, uh, trust and also experiences uh, in terms of uh, further uh, liberalization and, uh, and uh, facilitation. Thank you. Uh, Leslie? I think it's a really important point about regionalism. And I think um, I regret that the US hasn't been uh, more willing to engage 
regionally in uh, the trade in the CPTPP and then CPTPP. I think it's a mistake, and I hope that at some point, perhaps a couple of years in to the Biden administration, when America is more back on track domestically, that that decision might be revisited. Um, but I, I do think that there's a there's a danger in in regionalism and, and in splintering. And it, it, it certainly, that concern seems to be reflected in, in the UK's tilt to the Indo-Pacific, the US embrace of an Indo-Pacific strategy in the Quad and any number of efforts that demonstrate that, you know, there are gonna be different institutions that one works through, not a singular institution, but that the staying in the game of regionalism in Asia is absolutely critical. And I, I also wanted to pick up on one point that I thought was really important that Dr. Rockin made earlier and that kind of gets to the India question, which is um, when you said that that it's also competition, America's soft power diplomacy and getting out in front of the vaccine dissemination question, it's competition um, with China. I think it, it takes, I think that's exactly right. And, and, and I think it's very healthy and very productive. It also kind of turns us to the India question, which was raised. I can't answer it in the specific way it was raised, but I think the, the focus on India is real, it's significant. At the moment, we're all devastated for the, for the public health crisis that India is experiencing. It's probably a big part of why the US at this moment as time has taken that decision on the TRIPS waiver um, because India is so important, because it is a democracy, because it's geopolitically important. It's a turning point, I think, for awareness of how devastating the impact of the, of the pandemic could be. Um, in different parts of the global south and that that is perhaps the beginning, not the end of what we might see. Um, but, I, but I think the focus on India and its role and which way it goes um, is, is a really important one, not only for Europe, of course, but, but certainly for the US and will be at the center of much of uh, diplomacy going forward. Thank you. And we're now, I see my red clock is counting down, but we had two polls with our audience while we were discussing. And the first was, is great power competition the driver of contemporary geopolitics? And amazingly, and it's the first time I've ever seen it in a poll, the answer is 100% yes. So that's very rare. <laughs> that there, are, It's very rare to get 100%. On the second question, which is, are you confident that the EU can navigate a world of great power competition? 30% very confident, 65% not so confident, and 5% not confident at all, and zero for don't know. So it was something on which everyone had a view. So this brings our uh, plenary session to an end. I'd like to thank all three of you for your engagement and your openness uh, in our discussion and for the range of topics we covered. And there's no doubt the world is at a historical inflection point. We are, uh, at times they are transshifting. Of course, there's nothing inevitable about the next 10 years. Events matter, human agency matter, our institutions matter. Uh, of course, structural shifts always have a very significant impact. But I think because our focus was on Europe at a time of great competition, the big takeaway is that this is the hour of Europe, but not with the hubris that was demonstrated after the, uh, after the end of the Cold War, but rather that Europe has very tough choices to make. Tough choices about how it is in the world, how it engages with these great powers uh, and how it manages to navigate uh, a very different time in history. And it has agency, it has uh, capacity, and the question is how will it use it? And my second big takeaway is that post the Trump um, presidency, which was a, a shock, a shock to, to, it disturbed everything about the international order. Uh, there is now a multilateral moment. And of course, there's an extraordinary demand for global governance out there, not least public health, the public goods that we that were spoken about, and of course, the climate crisis. So we have to hope for that humankind has learned and that there it is possible to have a plan for our planet and for our people uh, and that the competition which is inevitable will be encased in institutions and structures and frameworks also 
that mitigate friction, manage friction, and also allow for cooperation. So my thanks to all three of you and to the audience, and have a very good day. And please tune in to the rest of the State of the Union, where these topics will be looked at again. Thank you. Thank you.